Um, so I had a great time doing this, partly because um, I, I don't know if I don't know if you're like me, but I have a set of books that I try to read every year that I know I'll never get tired of. And some books I think I'm going to read every year, but I don't. The one book I read every year, and I think I have for, gosh, maybe a decade at least, uh, is a book by Matsuo Basho called Narrow Road to the Deep North or Narrow Road to the Interior. I love this book. It's a weird book. I'm going to talk more about it in detail uh, later. But um, it's, it's a book I never get tired of. Sometimes I like cheat and read it in the spring and then read it again in the autumn because I can't wait for the next spring to read it. Um, all right, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, it, to, it's just such a lovely, lovely book. I'm going to read you sections of it. Uh, this is called On the Briefest of Poems, though I wrote very short poems. I really like that, that term, very short poems. I'm going to explain why I'm using it in a moment. I'm going to read uh, a lecture to you on haiku and its place in history, and then we're going to get to the fun stuff. But hopefully the lecture can get you excited about, or at least interested in, why we might want to do the exercise that we end up doing. On the briefest of poems, we expect literature to take a while. We pick up a novel and gauge by its thickness the hours, days, even weeks it will take us to finish. If you're anything like me, you weigh that imagined time against your interest. A juicy noir that looks a few days long, I'm pretty much sold. A dusty Victorian social drama that will take a month or more, <laughs> less interested, I must admit. But literature isn't all that way. There is a literature the experience of which is measured not in days or weeks, but in brief pauses, in a long and lingering moment. This is a literature that, when it lasts for longer than a minute or two, lasts like the sound of a deep bell that you heard chime the hour and that you keep remembering the next day, the next year, when you are old. What takes a few seconds to first read can take a lifetime to ponder. This type of literature is the very short poem. Most of us were made to encounter short poems at some point in school. Typically, this short poem is a sonnet, either by Shakespeare, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, or Browning, how do I love thee, let me count the ways. You know, it was after I read that that I realized, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, and how do I love thee, let me count the ways. They rhyme with each other. I think <laughs> it's kind of cool. But the sonnet is, relative to the shortest forms of poetry, rather long. It's 14 lines, or 140 syllables. Tonight, it's a lot of syllables. Tonight, I want to introduce and advocate, advocate some forms that are much shorter. Perhaps you've met the rhyming quatrain, perfected by Emily Dickinson. Can someone read the Dickinson poem for us? Thanks. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies too bright for our infirm delight. The truth's superb surprise as lightning to the children eased with explanation kind. The truth must dazzle gradually for every man be blind. Thank you. This is eight lines or 56 total syllables. But we can go shorter. In the early 20th century, a superb poet with a silly name Adelaide Crapsey invented a form of poem called the syncane. It looks like it's pronounced syncane, but it's syncane. I'll probably mispronounce it. It's only five lines with lines of, in order, two syllables, four syllables, six syllables, eight syllables, and finally back to two syllables. That's only 22 syllables in all. Here's a syncane called November Night. Can someone else read this for us? Go for it. Listen. With faint, dry sound, like steps of passing ghosts, the leaves, frost crisp, break from the trees and fall. Crapsey published her Sing Canes in 1915, right in the middle of a decade that was fast becoming fascinated with very short poems, like never before in American history. Ezra Pound wrote a poem around the same time that was only two lines long, though it has a pretty long title. This is In a Station of the Metro. Can someone read this for us? Go for it. The apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black robe. 
not counting the eight-syllable title, this poem is only 19 syllables long. In fact, it's not even a complete sentence. <laughs> uh, I actually, I, I, I love this poem. I teach it every year, but I never realized that until preparing this. Like, there's, there's not really a verb. <laughs> not to be outdone, in 1922, the American poet Ivor Winters wrote a whole book of poems in perhaps the most minuscule form in American literature, a single line of six or seven syllables. This, is sometimes, this sometimes results in a nice image, as in his poem, Still Morning. Can someone read Still Morning? Go for it. Snow air, my fingers curl. But it sometimes also results in an indicative sentence, as in Blue Mountain. It's on the next page. Can someone go for it. A deer walks that mountain. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. The best poems in the collection manage to give us two images that sit pleasingly next to one another, as in spring rain. Someone reads, yeah, go for it. My door frame smells of weed. <laughs> it's not a lot, and it could be mistaken for prose, but it contains a little mystery. Door frames and leaves are pretty different things. Why does the one smell like the other? It's almost a little magical. Well, we're now a long way from mystery novels and even sonnets. If you add up all the syllables in all 28 of the poems in Winter's book, they hardly make more than a sonnet's worth of syllables. Uh, <laughs> it's, the book is called The Magpie's Shadow, and it's like 40 pages. But it's like 40 sentences, but not always a sentence. It's a very, I, if, if you paid for that book, you know, you go out and, you know, buy it for 10 bucks, and you're like, wait, this is 150 syllables in this book. That's not, that's not very much. <laughs> Why write such short poems? Why read them? I want to give a historical answer to the first question and let that lead into answering the second question. First, why, after the epics of Homer and Virgil, the sonnets of Shakespeare, and the quatrains of Dickinson, do we end up with the minuscule poems of the early 20th century? In brief, blame it on haiku. Haiku is a traditional form of poetry from Japan that became incre increasingly popular and influential in the West in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In, late, in the late Victorian era, Japan, which had been closed to the Western powers for centuries, finally adopted a new policy of cultural openness that allowed for a huge influx of Japanese art and literature to the West. You can see this in, in, in art and even in, um, in clothing. Uh, in the late Victorian era, people start wearing like kimonos and stuff like that. It's because it's coming into Western culture for the first time. There's sort of a Victorian, late Victorian obsession with Japan. And this also, this also um, occurs in America. Longfellow's uh, son, I'm a Longfellow scholar, so I have to put in a plug for Longfellow in Japan. Longfellow's son became obsessed with Japan and actually went there and bought a samurai sword and like a samurai robe and then went and took photographs, which are, you know, not terribly, you know, uh, easy to get, took photographs of himself as a samurai with like a samurai top. Now, and we still have these photographs of little Charlie Longfellow. Well, he's not little, he's probably like a teenager, but he's got his samurai sword. Um, Luckily, no one cosplays as samurais today. <laughs> Does anyone own a samurai sword? Luca. Uh, <laughs> do, do you own a samurai sword? That's awesome. Both British and American poets and scholars became fascinated with haiku at the turn of the century. Young poets like Ezra Pound and Adelaide Crapsey saw in Japanese poetry new formal possibilities for English poetry and began to turn from the popular forms of the Victorian poets, regular meters like pentameter and tetrameter and traditional end rhymes, think, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, things like that, toward the formal concerns of Japanese poetry, which were foremost arrangement of images and the patterning of syllables. Not the patterning of stress and unstressed syllables, but, but numerical patterns of syllables. When Western poets met the haiku, it was already a mature form. At the most basic level, the haiku is made up of three phrases, often rendered as three lines in English. The first line typically has five syllables, the second line seven syllables, and the third line five syllables, for a total of 17 syllables. Not as few as Winters, 
but a little fewer than than uh, than pound and crapsy are going for. Um, so I'm going to write the. Where did my red pen go? Here it is. That's the first of the important elements. It's listed third because we're going to get to the mysterious Kiregi and Kigo in a minute. It also must be about particular subjects in a particular way. The Japanese poetry scholar Stephen Addis sums up the three important characteristics of traditional haiku. First, he writes, is closeness to nature, which supplies most of the images that the poems rely upon to convey their meanings. This usually involves concrete observations expressed briefly and clearly through use of everyday language and a syntax that is natural rather than poetic. You won't find, even in English language uh, haiku, uh, shall I compare thee to a summer's day. Shall and thee, those are no-nos. Those are um, poetic language, much more straightforward. A good example of this is Basho's famous haiku about a frog. Uh, can someone read this at the ancient pond poem? Go for it. This is all observation of nature, giving a concrete description of a common event. We don't see the speaker, nor have a description of what the poet was thinking or considering. It's not when I consider that the frog has jumped. I think of life and how it is so short. No, none of that. We only have the event. We can see in Crapsy's Sinquain, Pounds in a Station of the Metro, and Winter's short poems, this same attention to concrete details of nature. The second characteristic of haiku, Addis writes, are references to a particular season. These references are called kigo. This can, of course, take the form of a poet just telling us what time of year it is directly, like in Crapsy's November Night. When is it? November. November. Easy. But as Addis points out, the haiku poets of Japan prized subtlety and have developed, or had developed, whole lists of images that would suggest a particular season to the reading audience. And here's Addis on, on these images. To give just a few of the many possible examples, frogs, swallows, warblers, the hazy moon, late frost, and plum or cherry blossoms are all indicators of spring. While for summer, there are short nights, herons, toads, lilies, duckweed, I don't even know what that is, and hail. Fall includes the harvest moon, lightning, dew, deer, grasshoppers, dragonflies, and persimmons. While winter is indicated by snow, frost, ice, owl, ducks, fallen leaves, and of course, bare trees. So, Kigo, this is the season word. Some of these images seem obvious to us, bare trees for winter, frost, etc., and some less so. I'm not quite sure why toads are summertime things. I guess if it's very cold, they are hibernating in mud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I realize I'm not sure whether amphibians hibernate. <laughs> From Addis's list, we can determine that Basho's frog haiku indicates spring with its featured animal. Here is another. Can someone read this Chiyo uh, haiku? Go for it. Hundreds of gourds, ah, <laughs> all coming from the heart of a single vine. What do you think is the Kigo, or season word, in this haiku by the monastic poet Chiyo? Gourds? What season is it? Fall. Fall. Yeah, I think <laughs> so. I kind of think it's summer. Right, okay. Because by fall, the vine would be dead. Oh, yeah. Even though we can afford to sort of fall. Yeah. I mean, in this climate, it's, it's interesting. I didn't go into this, but actually, if I had more time, I would have. And now I'm going to, impromptu. Um, I think it's cool that, that writing a haiku um, about nature, where you are, and especially having the sense of time, means 
your indications of time will, will be kind of localized, right? If I write um, uh, heavy rain and thunder as my first line, um, if, you're in, if you're in Texas, you're gonna be like spring or occasionally fall when there's a, when there's a um, uh, hurricane. But, you know, write that somewhere else when the rainy season's, you know, December and it's different. So I, I like that sort of localized uh, um, perception of time. We're going to get into perception of time more in a minute. Third, and most importantly, Addis writes, haikus suggest rather than define their meanings, leaving much of the process up to the reader or listener. In fact, Scott Cairns, uh, the contemporary Orthodox poet, has said that a poem isn't really a poem unless it has this element, unless it has this element of leaving some connections for the reader to make. I don't know that I agree totally with that, but it's certainly going on in haiku. In effect, the audience joins with the writer in completing the poem, Addis says. One of the ways the haiku writer nudges the reader toward helping to make meaning is through intentional juxtaposition of two images. In Chio's haiku above, she juxtaposes the hundred gourds with a single vine. What is the significance of this juxtaposition? The ancient pond is juxtaposed with the plunging frog, which in turn arguably is juxtaposed with the sound of water. And um, there's, there's a website where you can compare 30 different translations of the frog haiku, and how they talk about the relationship of the sound of the water to the frog jumping in is so different. Some have the, frogs jumps, the frog jumps into the sound of water. Some have the frog jumps in the sound of water. Some have the frog jumps, plop, kersploosh. Um, <laughs> it's pretty fun. <laughs> um, so I, I, I sort of cheated in my translation. Um, I don't know Japanese, but uh, I use the, um, the literal translations of the words to sort of uh, put it together. I, I kind of, I, I tell, I explain more, I think, in my translation than he gives us. His is old pond, frog jumps in, water sound. And we have to figure out, okay, how does this work? Um, so what I suggest is, is pretty, pretty standard. Addis translates it very similar to how, how I rendered it, but plop ker splosh is another valid translation. <laughs> we had earlier said that there's a pleasingness to the juxtaposed image of the door frame and the smell of leaves in Winter's poem. He has inherited this from the haiku tradition, and I'd go further and say, Modernist poetry doesn't happen without the influx of Japanese poetry into the Victorian era. Um, this is also true of um, uh, poets' interest, in particular Ezra Pound's interest in Chinese poetry. And there's a bigger story to tell about this whole idea of Eastern poetry as the non-Westernness that, po that Western poetry needs to, um, to come alive in the 20th century. That's a longer story to tell. But Japanese poetry, without it, modernism just doesn't happen. You know, if you hate modernism, well, One of the ways Japanese haiku poets suggest connections, uh, so I think on the whole this talk, uh, on the whole this talk, I think m might give us reason to, to appreciate those things in modernist poetry. Ezra Pound in particular gets thrashed a lot for, um, for right, uh, In a Station in the Metro is, is just so different than Idols of the King by Tennyson or um, My Heart Dances with the Daffodils by Wordsworth. It's so different. A lot of people say, okay, Pound just ruined poetry. Uh, I, I'm suggesting that, that there are things to see there that maybe we would miss if we hastily um, you know, rejected it. One of the ways Japanese haiku poets suggest connections is the usage of a word called a kareji, or cutting word. Uh, a, similar, a similar term to cutting word would be cesura, which we use in Western poetry more, but it's a little bit different. I'll explain. I translated the kareji in Chiyo's haiku as ah. In Japanese, it is ya, an untranslatable word that suggests a thoughtful pause. Uh, we see this a lot in Gerard Manley Hopkins' work. He'll say ah um, uh, with warm breast and with ah bright wings when he's talking about the, um, the Holy Spirit uh, in the first chapter of uh, Genesis, and maybe also in the present. We'll get, we'll get to the Hopkins. Um, 
This pause also indicates to the reader that they should ponder the connection between the images that are on either side of it. The koregi in each haiku is usually found at the end of the first or second line. Basho's frog haiku includes the koregi, ya, again, at the end of the first line. So it's, it's like old pond, a frog jumps in. The koregi is sort of that, like, old pond, and then it's balanced with. You could say, oh, the old pond. That's, that's, too, that's too artificial, though. It's too artificial. Uh, Selah in the Psalms, in Hebrew poetry, uh, is a little bit like a cutting word as well. It's a pause. Though Selah has, has other uh, connotations as well. Um, that probably ya doesn't have. Um, I think no is another one uh, that's often treated as a cutting word. What led to the development of such a short form of poem becoming so popular in Japanese poetry? This is the history lesson now. Though the haiku and its rules were fully developed by the time it became popular among English language writers, it took several centuries to develop into its mature form. The path to the haiku begins around 700 AD, so a full uh, thousand years before we're getting, you know, the beginnings of uh, Japanese poetry being even accessible to, uh, to the West, when some of the earliest extant Japanese poetry was written. This ancient poetry is found in collections like the Nanyoshu. Is anyone familiar with the Nanyoshu? Uh, there's a copy of it in my office. Check it out sometime. Uh, the Nanyoshu contains poems by dozens of different writers. In the Nanyoshu, we find a type of poem called the Renga. R-E-N-G-A. The Renga is a long collaborative poem written by two or more poets who trade off writing stanzas. The odd numbered stanzas of the, stanzas of the Renga consist of three lines of five, seven, and five syllables. Hey, that's familiar. The even numbered stanzas are two lines of seven syllables each. So one poet will write five, seven, five. The next poet will write seven, seven then five, seven, five, and seven, seven. If there's more than two people writing, it'll be first person, second person, third person, first person, second. So you're, you're not always writing the same style. Japanese writers prize the creative challenges of collaboration on long rengas of many stanzas that maintain coherence while providing variation and dialectical balance. How can you interact with the stanza that came before you and continue the theme, but also put your own spin on it, have a little conversation? The first stanza of the renga came to be called the haku. The honor of writing the initial haku was usually given to the, a person of honor, uh, an accomplished poet or nobleman. A fine dinner party at a nobleman's house in medieval Japan might include renga among its party games, with the noble host of the party playing the part of the haku writer. A revered poet might boost the popularity of a new book of renga by writing the haku at its opening as well. It's like a, an unproved novelist writes a novel, no one wants to read it, but then Stephen King writes the introduction. It's like, ooh, I'll buy it. It has Stephen King's <laughs> name on it. Uh, uh, this is actually Basho did. The only book um, under Basho's name that was published during his life is a book called The Shell Game, which he just wrote the haku for, and then you know, students of poetry wrote the rest of it. The haku stanza largely remained a part of the renga tradition until the 17th century, when the poet Matsuo Basho helped to detach it from the renga and make it a complete poem in its own right. Basho was a master poet of his era, pretty much the master poet of his era. And if you have to come down to who's the greatest poet that ever lived in Japan, eh, it's probably Basho. That's my opinion. There are other opinions. <laughs> um, uh, Saigyo is, is important. Um, uh, Isa, I think you're a big Isa fan, right? Uh, Isa, Isa is seen as the more like s rebellious scamp poet. Basho is <laughs> a little more like staid. Isa is like, <laughs> I will write a haiku about silly things, um, we, we, things. or profound things. Uh, it's it's um, climb Mount Fuji. It's we have it hanging in the reading room. It's O oh, snail, climb Mount Fuji, but slowly, slowly. <laughs> so. There are other poets other than Basho. Uh, Basho began to incorporate haku into another type of writing called haibun, or nonfiction prose narrative, with haku woven into it. The most famous haibun is The Narrow Road to the Interior, or Narrow Road to the Deep North. 
Here's an excerpt from the opening chapter where Basho sets out on a long journey to the wild north of Japan. And that's the little paragraph in Poa under it. Can someone, poem under it, can someone read that for us? Go for it. I patched my torn trousers and changed the cord on my bamboo hat. To strengthen my legs for the journey, I had moxa burned on my shins. But then I could think of nothing but the moon and Matsushima. When I sold my cottage and moved to Santos Villa to stay until I started on my journey, I hung this poem on a post in my hut. Even a thatched hut may change with a new owner into a doll's house. So we can see he's giving us kind of straightforward prose, like here's what I did that day, and then I wrote this poem, and then he gives us this poem. This is the whole thing. I, I want to read you another one, um, the, uh, the Summer Grasses poem, which is up here. I'm going to read you the intro to it, uh, and then the poem. After crossing a long, miserable march, we stayed at Toyima, pushing on to Hirazumi in the morning, an arduous trek of over 40 difficult miles in two days. Here, three generations of Fujiwara clan passed as though in a dream. The great outer gates lay in ruins. Where Hidehiro's manor stood, rice fields grow. Only Mount Kinke remained. I climbed the hill where Yoshitsune died. I saw the Kit Kitakami, a broad stream flowing down from the Nambu Plain, the Koromo River circling Izumi Castle, below the hill before journeying, joining the Kitakami. The ancient ruins of Yashira, from the end of the Golden Era, lie out beyond the Koromo Barrier, where they stood guard against the Ainu people. The faithful elite remained bound to the castle, for all their valor reduced to ordinary grass. We sat a while, our hats for a seat, seeing it all through tears. The summer grasses, what remains of the soldiers, imperial green. So, as you can tell, I mean, I don't know much about Japanese history or geography, but you get a sense of um, that he's passionate about it, and when he says the Kitakami, it means, you know, the Mississippi to him, or something like that. Um, his travel narrative in prose is considered some of the greatest ever written. And he's linking it with these haku, which his, his readers would have seen as, oh, he's, he's giving us an example of the beginning of a renga. But them standing alone begin to work in the readers, uh, well, this is a complete poem in itself. And you can see how his poem is sort of a summing up of the longer prose uh, that he's writing about. Um, S somebody, somebody read this, this next one, The Temple's temple Stillness. The Temple's Stillness. The cries of the cicadas sink deep into the stone. I'm going to read one more to you, and then we'll uh, sum up. It is wider than the white bricks of this temple, the wind of autumn. I have to read you just one more thing, because it's really good. This is the book I read every year, so... In Yamagata province, the ancient temple founded by Jikaku Daishi on, in 860, Ryushaku Temple is stone quiet, perfectly tidy. Everyone told us to see it. It meant a few miles extra, doubling back toward Obanazawa to find shelter. Monks at the foot of the mountain offered rooms. Then we climbed the ridge to the temple, scrambling up through an ancient gnarled pine and oak gray smooth stones and moss. The temple doors, built on rocks, were bolted. I crawled among boulders to make my bows at the shrines. The silence was profound. I sat, feeling my heart begin to open. And then we get the temple stillness, cries of the cicada sink deep into the stone. I just love this book. It's so good. Um, Through these and other haku, Basho inspired generations of Japanese poets to write haku not as preliminary stanzas for renga, but as whole poems in their own right. 19th century Japanese poets began calling these standalone haku by the name of haiku to distinguish them from the first stanza of a renga. And then Japan opened to the West. It went global. 
Several American writers of the 20th century became accomplished haiku writers in their own right, including Richard Wright, who's more known for uh, his novel Native Son. Anyone read Native Son? He wrote hundreds of haiku. Uh, Jack Kerouac has a book of haiku, um, but uh, he doesn't. He doesn't follow the the rhyme scheme or the the uh, syllable scheme. He's a little more rebellious. He's like two syllables, five syllables, one syllable. Uh, and Richard Wilbur, uh, who the um, seniors are reading this year, uh, also writes haiku. He he actually has established like a new form of haiku where it's five seven five, but the five these two lines rhyme with each other. And then he'll write chains of them. It's sort of like rhyming haiku. They're kind of becoming renga again, but incorporating, uh, incorporating uh, the, the more Western rhyme scheme. And very interesting. Because the haiku does not take long to write, and because it, it rules a rel its rules are relatively simple, it has long been a favorite poetry exercise for beginning writers and a favorite poetic form to criticize for those who are perhaps a little hasty. I, I, I know poets who write in public professionally who are like, yeah, haiku, yeah, those aren't really poems. We, too, in a moment, will practice some haiku writing. But before we do, I'd like to come around to the second question I posed earlier. Why write them? Why read them? And that is, why write very short poems like haiku? Why, why write the six-syllable poem? Uh, that, uh, that Ivor Winters does. It, it's, get, it's bordering on ridiculous. Well, maybe. I've summarized why haiku became popular and in, an influential art form in Japanese literature, but why ought we today, we're not 17th century people touring Japan, uh, why should we today concern ourselves with such forms? Let me suggest in brief four reasons. They're gonna, going to go from practical to not very practical. One. To write a haiku, one must exercise mindfulness and stillness. In order to write about natural images, we must first slow down and observe. We must observe each object's relationship to the objects around them, and then slowly and carefully put those images into words. In exercising quiet noticing, and careful expression, we are enacting disciplines vital to both mature living and to spiritual progress and to classroom management. <laughs> I, I didn't write that, but I'll add it. <clears throat> <laughs> Two, haiku is an exploration of the relationship between time and matter. When we write a haiku, we are not just juxtaposing objects, we are juxtaposing objects in time. I said I'd come back around to time. The season word, or kigo, makes us do this. And in doing so, we are led into a consideration of our own relationship to time, to what is seasonable, and perhaps out of season, in our own rhythms of life. Three, haiku is a simple way to respond to sensory beauty with an artifact of verbal beauty. I'll say that again. Haiku is a simple way to respond to sensory beauty, beauty we take in with our senses, with an artifact of verbal beauty, a creation in words. Basho's temple stones, Chio's vines, these are images that surely struck the poets as beautiful in their own right. We picture Basho visiting an ancient temple, drinking in the silence, feeling the solidity of the cut stone around him, and then, and then discerning the rising cry of the cicada, and experiencing all of this as a moment of real and memorable <coughs> beauty. The haiku becomes his way to honor the moment, to preserve the quiet wonder of its intersections and possible meanings. And because it is so short, the crafting of such an homage to the moment seems much more able to be accomplished than a novel set at the temple, say, or an oil painting, of the landscape. Not that novels and oil paintings aren't worthwhile, it's just if you're standing at the temple, and you're like, oh, this is so beautiful, I'm gonna get my paints. <laughs> now you could, I know people will do it. Maybe you've done it. I'm looking at you Irwins. <laughs> Four, it's getting a little weird for a second, just bear with me. Haiku is grounded in an ontology that honors the importance of the material world. Many haiku poets were influenced by Zen Buddhism, which is interested not merely in the surface of an object, but of its interior essence. 
Jane Reichhold, a translator of Basho, writes this. Haiku and Zen are closely linked. Buddhist teachings and the poetry of Basho train us to search for the essence, the very being of the smallest common things. One of the goals of poetry is to penetrate this essence, to grab hold of it in words and pass it on to the reader. A parallel to this view can be found in the thought of the Catholic poet Gerard Manley Hopkins. Toward the end of the 19th century, Hopkins wrote, each mortal thing does one thing and the same, deals out that being indoors each one dwells, selves, goes itself, myself, it speaks and spells, crying, what I do is me, for that I came. That's a poem that I just quoted. That's not just him writing prose. Um, that's As Kingfishers Catch Fire. Uh, it's a great sonnet. Hopkins is here influenced by the medieval thought theology of heseity, or thisness, a belief in the real knowable essence of each thing, be it as common as a leaf or chestnut. To this, Hopkins adds an even deeper level. This is the next line of the poem. I say more, the just man justices keeps grace, that keeps all his goings graces, acts in God's eye what in God's eye he is, Christ. For Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not his, to the Father through the features of men's faces. It's just good stuff. <laughs> yeah. Each thing is its own valuable, unique self that in and of itself is enough to wonder at. But also flickering through the cosmos of objects is Christ, their creator. Rather than dim the world of wonder, this theology, I would argue, makes the whole interest of haiku in concrete objects even more vital. Every leaf and stone and yes, toad are stunning selves and avenues of divine presence. This is not to reduce God to creation, but to honor creation as a place where God can dwell and meet us. Let us not in this forget our own selves, for we are being possessing beings. I'll say that again. We are being possessing beings. We have deep within an essence, a soul, a noose in Greek. And the old wise fathers tell us, down there with our being dwells God, just waiting to be found if only we are still enough. It may have been Elder Sophroni who said, true prayer is becoming silent enough to realize God has been praying within you the whole time. Now I said it was gonna get weird. And it just did. But if our practices are nowhere tied to divine mystery, we should question their worth. I'll say that again. If our practices are nowhere tied to divine mystery, we should question their worth. We will now move back to the practice end of things, though. And here's a reminder from Jane Reichhold, the Basho translator. Yes, she says, the writer needs that moment of inspiration and clarity between the worlds of reality and eternity. But in order to transmit the image, feeling, and vision, one must use words in the best possible way. This means practice, and it demands not being pleased with the first effort. It takes courage and determination to continue the work for days in some cases years, to find the right words for an eight to 10 word poem. So we start with this moment of clarity where, where reality and eternity meet. And Reichhold reminds us, how do we get to that in poetry? Practice, work on the eight to 10 words. And that's what we get to do now. Um, before, thank you.